name is Alan. Today we're gonna start off with some ASMR of me chewing some watermelon. Cause how to f out right out. When Moff Will of Tarkin brought his Death Star into the Yavin system, Bro was running high on a string of devastating shows of force and power thanks to his newly built super weapon that he totally didn't steal. He had cracked open the cursed ancient Jedi world of Jeddah with just a single reactor ignition. He had devastated the rebel attempt to steal the Death Star plans in Scarif, and conveniently wiped out the real project manager of the Death Star director Orson Krennic. Then we have Alderaan's destruction, which was so complete that there wasn't even any space dust left for the Alderanians remaining to collect. That's what happens when you do a full ignition strike on a planet, I guess. And well, Yavin 4, it was just a tiny moon, and the rebels with their puny strike force of a few dozen snub fighters stood no chance in even denting the moon-sized battle station. Or so Tarkin thought. Will of Tarkin, despite his obsession with being the strongest, most disciplined, and most powerful individual in a room, was always too arrogant to focus on the smaller details, like the bathrobe slippers that he usually wore uh, below the waist, where the camera can't really see him. Yes, the rebel snub fighters didn't pose much of a threat to his massive space station, but that doesn't necessarily mean he needed to allow them to get close enough where they could cause a lot of damage to surface installations. Scrambling the station's thousands of TIE fighters could have ended the rebel attack before it even started. And then of course there was the complete ignorance about the design flaws hidden within the Death Star. Even though there clearly was a rebel plot to capture the Death Star's engineering plans, Tarkin never believed that anything could take down such a large installation. Ultimately the buck stopped at Tarkin, he was given a massive responsibility, and he essentially fell asleep at the wheel, allowing for one of the most unlikely and lopsided victories in galactic history. Before we continue, a quick word from today's sponsor, War Thunder. It's the ultimate free-to-play vehicular combat game available on PC, consoles, and mobile. With over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships from 10 major nations from 1920s to today, it's truly a dream for military hardware junkies and history buffs who want to see all of their favorite vehicles in action. Or maybe you want to see, I don't know, vehicles from different era fighting each other, like an M1 Abrams versus a Tiger tank. Kinda sounds cool. I especially like War Thunder's sophisticated damage model, which makes the battles far more strategic and immersive. There's no simple hitbox with hit points. A lucky shot to the right component can trigger a catastrophic explosion or disable key parts of a vehicle, making it essentially a mobility kill. An unlucky shot can even glance off of armor. Because Glorious slopes the Lenium armor and T-34 always defeats capitalism. This is all paired with a very cool X-ray vision of the mayhem that really never gets old. So battle in stunningly realistic PvP combat across PC, console, and now there's even a mobile version of the game. So join 70 million players online on PC, PlayStation, Xbox, or mobile by using our links in the description down below and experience military history like never before. New players or returning players who haven't played in the last six months will get a massive bonus pack full of goodies across PC and consoles, including the exclusive vehicle decorator Eagle of Valor, 100,000 Silver Lions, and seven days of premium account access, only for a limited time. Thank you for your patience, on to the rest of the video. Will of Darkens failures should have been a warning for every young Imperial graduating out of the academy. Tarkin's folly, as it should have been called, should have been studied and turned into a lesson on hubris and never underestimating an enemy. That's right. So good. Velveteen chose to honor Grand Moff Will of Tarkin by building another space station in his arm. For some reason, Palpatine's always had a soft spot for that psychopath from Miradu, maybe because Tarkin for a normie was quite sip like in how he thought. As such, Tarkin's legacy wouldn't be one of just failure. No, his name would be tied to, in my opinion, a much more efficient and better version of what the Death Star is. This is how the Death Star should have looked in the first place. So the destruction of the first Death Star was devastating for the Empire. First, the amount of resources expended on the project was simply astronomical, and now it was all basically flushed down the toilet. This created a massive economic problem for the Emperor, one that he believed he could spend his way out of just through building another military. In Legends, Palpatine really doubles down on this idea of super weapons. He has his engineer Bevel Lemelisk, who was responsible for the Death Star, to start working on several different super weapon projects. This included the second Death Star and a pair of massive warships, both equipped with actual super lasers known as as the Eclipse class Dreadnought. Now, key to the development of these two super ships and also the second Death Star was a new improved super laser that was far more efficient, far more powerful than the original one found 
on the first Death Star. This super laser needed a structure to serve as a test bed for it before it was actually deployed in a larger structure. And so Palpatine ordered Bevel Lemelis to start the construction of a prototype of the Eclipse class and turn it into an operational weapons platform. The thought was that if they didn't build a giant ship and just build kind of a space station, it would be much harder for rebels to find. And should they find it, they would find it completely operational and probably kick their faces in. And this is what would be known as the Tarkin Project, or simply the Tarkin, a battle station that improves on the Death Star in almost every way. The design of the Tarkin would start in the highly secretive Maw installation, a facility known for developing the Empire's most dangerous experimental technologies. The Maw installation was a series of asteroids built into a larger research center in the midst of the Maw Cluster, a very chaotic series of black holes that was basically impossible to navigate through without special coordinates or through using the Force. Think about the Maelstrom that Solo has to pilot through when he's doing the Kessel Run, but like 50 times worse. It's actually rumored that this cluster was artificially created by godlike beings in the past using some type of gravitational technology to imprison a ferocious force creature known as your mom. Designed as a direct successor to the Death Star, the Tarkin was not merely a replica or a scaled down version, it was a complete doctrinal evolution. Engineered to embody Grand Moff Tarkin's philosophy of control through overwhelming fear, but without the critical design flaws that had doomed the original station, like having far too much surface space that needed to be defended and far too few point defense weapons emplacements. And of course, there's that pesky little exhaust port. You'd think they could have put like a dental dam over the hole to prevent, you know, unwanted penetration. Physically, the Tarkin resembled a more compact version of the Death Star featuring a central super laser dish and a spherical core. However, the overall station was smaller in diameter mass. It was around 42,000 meters in length and 75,000 meters in height. That's pretty massive, but much smaller than the Death Star's 120 kilometer diameter, if you in fact do believe that the Death Star was round and not disc-shaped. The Tarkin was also designed for greater mobility and faster production. The reduced size allowed for a more nimble propulsion system, one of its more important innovations, unlike the Death Star, which had to slowly drift into position at sublight speeds. During the Battle of Yavin, Tarkin actually had to wait for his battle station to clear the shadow of Yavin's gas giant before firing at the moon of Yavin 4. Those were precious minutes that allowed the rebels to hold a briefing and launch that strike package that ultimately destroys Tarkin. The Tarkin, on the other hand, could execute higher speed maneuvers. It wasn't just the planet you had to defend and, you know, with an entire fleet, the Tarkin could actually perform and move with a more complex formation of other ships screening it, and that makes it a much bigger tactical and strategic threat. Also, the Tarkin was equipped with hyper, uh, hyperdrive, I believe it was a class 4, and also had a backup class 20. So again, this thing could travel across the galaxy pretty quickly and surprise any rebel installation that is unfortunate enough to get caught by this thing. The station's defenses were also a significant upgrade over its predecessor. The Tarkin featured layer deflector shields capable of withstanding both capital ship fire and planetary scale bombardments. Its internal systems were also built with redundancy in compartmentalization, so you can't just have one small little flaw like the exhaust port create a cascading explosion that destroys the entire thing. The Tarkin is designed to be more modular, and therefore you can lose certain pieces of the station without compromising the entire ship. In fact, every substation was designed with sabotage resistance in mind. Critical areas were isolated behind biometric access points, and surveillance was omnipresent. Over 105,000 elite Stormtrooper units patrolled key corridors around the clock, while heavy blast doors and auto turrets secured reactor zones and weapon control centers. It should be noted the Tarkin also had a plethora of turbo laser emplacements and also ion cannons for defense and also point defense weapons, making it much harder for snub fighters to actually infiltrate the ship or, you know, fire at it at close ranges. The Tarkin's most terrifying feature, however, was its improved super laser. While still capable of destroying entire planets, most targets that the Tarkin or the Death Star would face were not planets. In fact, most of the time you're dealing with smaller capital ships. And so the Tarkin's main weapon had been refined to allow for variable yield strikes. This meant that instead of wasting the full power of a super laser on a single shot, it could deliver focus blasts that were appropriate for whatever you're targeting, whether it's a capital ship, a moon, or, you know, another space station. Every shot was just as powerful as it needed to be, making the entire system very efficient. The Tarkin Super Laser's recharge cycle, therefore, was significantly faster than the other Death Stars, allowing the station to fire multiple times in a single engagement. We can kind of see some of these upgrades applied to the second Death Star, which featured a different type of Super Laser, but as you see during the Battle of Endor, it was able to swat away many 
Mon Calamari cruisers like tiny flies. The target super laser was able to do this because there were a cluster of nodes around the main emitter, which really allowed the control system to adjust the intensity and focus of the beam. This innovation gave the Tarkin a kind of battlefield scalability that even the second Death Star would struggle to match. In smaller scale operations, the station could literally serve as a mobile orbital artillery platform, leveling surface infrastructure or crippling planetary defense systems without wiping out the entire planet. And then of course it can quickly be ramped up to destroy the entire planet if that becomes necessary. The Tarkin was really a game changer. If it entered a battlefield, it dominated it. The station also functioned as a command hub and mobile fortress. It featured extensive hangar bays capable of launching hundreds of TIE fighters, bombers, and transport shuttles. These hangars were reinforced to accommodate large-scale deployment of stormtroopers, walkers, and even prefabricated bases for planetary occupation. Command and control systems aboard the Tarkin rifled those of any sector fleet with secure long-range communications, advanced sensors, arrays, and real-time battle analysis tools that could coordinate fleet movement across entire systems. Internally, the Tarkin was divided into multiple self-contained decks, each with its own power and life support system. Again, this is to prevent the entire ship from just exploding all at once. These included crew barracks, officer quarters, detention blocks, weapons controls, command centers, power reactors, and military staging areas. The command tower itself was modeled on the bridge layout of an Imperial class Star Destroyer, a familiar interface for experienced officers, but reinforced internally survived direct hits and shield generator overloads. In many ways, the Tarkin represented the Empire's attempt to not just create a super weapon, but to really like try to make the Tarkin doctrine into a real thing that would actually work. And so the Tarkin was designed to be undefeatable, a symbol of relentless Imperial authority. And while it never saw a full operational deployment, its very existence was a reminder of how quickly and effectively the Empire could evolve its war machines in response to threats. The Tarkin was actually introduced to the fandom in 1981, which I find very interesting. It means that just a few years after the original Star Wars movie was released, you know, writers within the, the Star Wars universe already realized that there are a lot of flaws with the Death Star and they had set out to make a better version. Something that we are still doing as Star Wars creators uh, in the year 2025. Wow. Once the Tarkin was complete, on its first mission, Imperial Grand Admiral Martio Batch commandeered the vessel for his own project. You see, he had been tasked by Emperor Palpatine to build a functioning cloaking device that could conceal entire Star Destroyers, if necessary. The current cloaking technology was quite limited because it suffered from double blindness, meaning when it was activated, the individuals inside the ship couldn't really see outside, which made the effect a lot less useful. Martio Batch understood the only way to create functional and tactically useful cloaking devices was by gaining access to stigium crystals, which only found on the planet of Eaton. The mines of Eaton had been long emptied, and this is why there were no more functioning cloaking devices in the galaxy. This is an old technology that was very hard to revive, but Marjo had a plan. He wanted to use the Tarkin to crack open the planet, thereby revealing, hopefully, more, you know, nodes of crystals beneath the planet's surface, and it turns out he was right. The operation worked. The Tarkin was quite successful in his first job, which was, you know, mining a planet. Kind of like how the first Death Star accidentally mined Alderaan. The cracking of Aten led to a huge boost in cloaking technology, and the Empire would develop new platforms like the TIE Phantom. Now, the destruction of an entire planet caught the notice of the Rebels, and soon they started investigating what the hell was going on. Was there a second Death Star now? So let's go back a little bit. Once the design was complete for the Tarkin in the Maw installation, the Empire started construction of this ship at Patrum Shipyards in the Outer Rim. Although nowhere near as large as the original Death Star, the Tarkin was still a massive project, and it required a lot of resources and manpower, and therefore it's very hard to actually conceal uh, the creation of this thing. As a matter of fact, entire shanty towns popped up on the planet once construction commenced, and an entire fleet of Imperial class star stores were also deployed to protect the dry dock where this thing was being built. And very quickly, there was like a large square-shaped silhouette above the planet that everyone could see. I mean, this thing was massive. And so despite the Empire's best attempts, the Rebels eventually caught wind of this uh, project. Rebel pilot Marabatev even managed to lead a spy mission to Patrum where the schematics for the station were stolen. Rebel High Command went through the schematics and came to a realization that a frontal attack against the Tarkin was just suicidal. There were no weaknesses in its design. And so Rebel General Carlos Riken comes up with an alternative plan. Let's dispatch small commando teams to infiltrate the battle station and hopefully take it down from inside. It's actually a suicide mission if you think about it, right? 100,000 uh, stormtroopers on board with really compartmentalized levels that you can seal off, essentially, if you do detect intruders. But I guess Luke Skywalker, Chewbacca, and Princess Leia were all going to be members of the team, so you do have that kind of, like, hero support that 
you know, gives you some kind of protection. The larger strike team would be separated into three smaller strike teams led each by one of these heroes. Chewie would be focused on taking on the battle station's exterior tractor beam generator to allow for escape, similar to what Obi-Wan Kenobi does for everyone during the initial boarding of the Death Star. Princess Leia would secure an evacuation wrap by seizing control of a bunch of escape pods, and Skywalker would destroy the central reactor with a proton grenade. Unfortunately, by the time the mission starts, Darth Vader somehow arrives onto the platform, I guess, to take control of the ship. And to make matters even worse, Vader immediately feels Luke's presence and focuses on finding him so that he can turn the boy to the dark side. But here's the thing, Vader doesn't realize that the Tarkin's commanding officers have grown tired of Vader and his, you know, very unreasonable tendency to murder officers who fail him even in the slightest way. And so the command crew on the Tarkin had plotted to ambush and kill Vader. As you can expect, chaos ensues. The rebel plan doesn't really work at all. Only Chewbacca is successful at throwing an Imperial officer into the reactor that powers the tractor beam, so that at least gets shut off. But Vader's plans are also screwed up because now you have all these people trying to kill each other on the ship, including the commanding officers of the Tarkin. But here's the thing. Leia luckily stumbles upon one of the main weapons control systems for the super laser. And she's able to quickly switch the polarity on this weapon so that when it does fire, guess what happens? It blows itself. Up. And that's exactly what happens when Lando Calrissian and the Millennium Falcon arrives in system in an attempt to help his friends out. The Tarkin fires its weapon and it just blows up. So there you have it guys. That is the story about a much more efficient and better designed version of the Death Star. You know, I don't think it would have been anywhere near as iconic. Like had George Lucas had designed this more functional looking ship. A giant sphere is just much easier to... I guess understand visually and, it, and it's it's iconic for sure but again sometimes it's nice to go uh you know function over form and that's kind of what the tarkin was unfortunately the empire was still kind of crazy they didn't really properly understand how to use weapons like this and it was destroyed by a small rebels commando team with a bunch of plot armor. Thanks again to our sponsor for today's video, War Thunder. Don't forget to check out our links in the description down below to try it on PC, PlayStation, Xbox, or mobile. And get your sign-up bonus pack if you're new or returning after six months on PC or console. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.